Hey everybody, it's Ann Beebe. Today is Thursday, March 12th, 2020. I'm Barb Hammer. And um, today I want to talk about the big business of rigged elections in the USA and why your vote doesn't count if you vote in the USA. So, um, I got the idea for this video actually because of, let me adjust this a little bit, um, uh, videos that uh, Scott Crane on his Church Doc 42 channel has done about uh, the election, exit poll results in the Democratic primary so far. And it kind of jogged my memory about a lot of things that I learned in 2016 when I was really involved in the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign. And uh, it was a real eye opener with what was going on there. And um, one of the things I realized that isn't true is what the Democratic Party says. They claim, oh, it's just the Republicans who are guilty of voter suppression and election fraud. Well, both parties do that. So that was a lie. The DNC was lying about that. The Democratic Party was lying about that. So if you're wondering why I'm looking to the side, I occasionally use a whiteboard and just kind of write down some notes or whatever to get. Uh, I don't always do that, but <laughs> sometimes I do that um, if I'm smart and try to organize my thoughts a little bit better. I don't know if I'm going to be <laughs> better organized, but um, that's what I'm looking at, my little whiteboard. Maybe I'll put it down here. Um, yeah, so both the Republicans and the Democrats are guilty of election fraud and voter suppression. And I experienced voter suppression when I tried to cast a ballot, an absentee ballot as an expat, expat that's simply an American living outside of the US. So um, I, um, I don't vote anymore in US elections and I don't vote anymore in Canadian elections um, for similar reasons. But when I requested a, a ballot months in advance in 2016 from Virginia, from um, my home state, um, I got a lot of lame excuses for why I was not receiving the ballot. And um, they even made me re-register, even though my registration was valid. Um, they claimed they uh, mailed me the ballot physically, I think, at first. And it takes a while. So I allowed a couple of weeks. I still didn't receive something. So I told them, they said, oh, we've been really swamped and this and that. More lame excuses. So they um, finally they sent me a ballot by email that I could print out because I have to physically send the ballot back. That's the way it works. So, um, yeah, I finally had to, so if I had not been persistent and if I had not started asking for my ballot early enough, I would not have gotten my ballot in on time for the Virginia primary, which I think was in May of that year. Uh, so Virginia was actually part of the Super Tuesday um, primaries last week. So that was my experience, but I also noticed a lot of weird things going on. Um, um, when results were coming in from the primaries, Bernie would be ahead sometimes, and then suddenly the figures would switch and Hillary was ahead. So there was a lot of strange reporting of results, and I think similar things have been happening this election year in the primaries, Democratic primaries. Um, 
So yeah, uh, apparently uh, the elections uh, in the U.S. are actually not, um, they're not actually a public process. It's a business. It's been privatized. And one of the things that I've learned, what I learned in 2016 is the DNC, the Democratic National Committee that runs the Democratic Party is actually a private corporation. And that was um, the ruling um, a judge made when he dismissed the DNC fraud lawsuit that Jared and Elizabeth Beck um, filed. So um, in the arguments of that case, the DNC lawyers argued that the DNC has the right to pick candidates in back rooms. So they are not obligated to run uh, free and fair uh, primaries. And the judge agreed with him. Now that was appealed and um, it went further in the court system. I haven't kept up, I don't know. I think they were, they're trying to take it to the Supreme Court. That's the last I heard. I don't know if they had any luck with that. Of I don't know if the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case or not. I'm not sure. But that's what came out in the arguments. And, um, and then in the judge's uh, decision, the, uh, when, the ca when the case was first heard, the judge dismissed it and he said that the, you know, the DNC is a private corporation. It's not obligated to <laughs> um, run the primaries in a free and fair way. And um, it's because of this private party rights anyway. So it's a private corporation. They're allowed to do whatever they want. So I think a lot of people still are not aware of that that the DNC is a private corporation. I call it the DNC Incorporated. Yeah. So, and I'm, and I'm sure the Republican Party is the same setup. So it's a private corporation too. So uh, the DNC and the Republican National Committee, they are both big businesses. So, and that's, it's in their interest to, um, rig elections. Um, another thing that a problem with elections in the US is that the electronic voting. And that's where you see some funny business going on. And uh, if you get if you're able to get exit polling results, you will see the discrepancy between um, um, the official results and the exit polling. So the exit polling, exit polling is considered the gold standard for determining whether or not elections are free and fair. And I remember in 2016 hearing a ranking for the U.S. So the U.S. is was at the time 47th in the world for free and fair elections. So the greatest democracy in the world is not a democracy or a republic. It is an oligarchy and big business runs the U.S. So um, the way they determine how accurate the official results are is, I believe, if, uh, um, if the official results are by more than 2% or so, I believe, something like that then there has been, there are irregularities, there has been fraud. And we've been seeing a lot of that. We saw a lot of that in the primaries in 2016, the Democratic Party primaries, and again this year. And I believe uh, there were similar things going on in the Republican primaries in 2016. So um, initially it seems that um, George W. Bush's brother was the favored candidate that the ruling class wanted. Um, 
Jeb Bush, yeah, Jeb Bush apparently was the chosen one and they pumped a lot of money into his campaigns, but people didn't want him, so that didn't work out. And um, uh, and then it was Hillary Clinton who was the chosen one. <laughs> so uh, the Republican primaries, uh, they were trying to, they did steal some votes from Trump in the primaries, but he still won the nomination. That's because there's no, there's no super delic, delegate system in the Republican Party, unlike the Democratic Party. Now, the Democratic Party claims that they've uh, changed that to because a lot of people were upset in 2016 with the super delegates deciding who would become the nominee. But we're seeing similar things again. Um, so Joe Biden apparently is the chosen one this year. And they're trying to quickly uh, marginalize Bernie Sanders once again. Um, so, uh, super delegates. So, super delegates haven't always been around. Um, apparently, super de delegates uh, uh, were established in the Democratic Party after definitely after Jimmy Carter um, was president and he did not win re-election. Um, and that is another story. So they, there was an October surprise and his, uh, Jimmy Carter's, the Reagan campaign sabotaged uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, campaign by doing a deal with Iran over the hostages and getting them to not release the hostages as Jimmy Carter's administration had negotiated. That was the October surprise. That's another story. <laughs> anyway, so super de delegates. Uh, so I think they knew they had a problem with um, populist movements. So big business doesn't like populism because populism is about being concerned about the interests, uh, the well-being of the people. And uh, in 1972, the Democratic Party nominee was George McGovern. He was a populist. And uh, the Democratic Party sabotaged his campaign. And uh, Richard Nixon won a landslide as a result. And then in 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected. He was a populist again. Not perfect, but he was a populist. Um, and then his campaign was sabotaged in 1980. I guess big business uh, didn't like Jimmy Carter anymore. So he was on the outs or they didn't. Yeah, they definitely did not want him anyway. So anyway, so exit polling. So um, uh, there are, I discovered a new source uh, Scott had mentioned in a video and he uh, mentioned that I had found this uh, TDMS research, and that's for a fellow named Teodoro de, um, I forget. Ah, yeah, Teodoro de Marcelo, Marcelo, Teodoro de Marcelo Suarez. I think that's a Portuguese name. So I'm, I'm probably saying it in like a Spanish way, but anyway, he does research and he has been reporting on the discrepancy between um, the official results and exit polling. But he's delaying, he's not really reporting the results very quickly, and I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if it's deliberate. I think he has uh, sympathies for Bernie Sanders and is definitely a Democrat um, and would probably vote for Joe Biden, I bet. So I don't know if he's delaying the results or of his, the findings of his research because he wants people to forget about this. I don't know. So we don't have the results for the latest primaries from Tuesday, many Tuesday primaries from this past Tuesday yet. And Scott was wondering why the delay and I'm wondering too. So anyway, they're being reported, but not very quickly. He has a Twitter account and you're not going to get any newer information there than from the website here. 
Another good source on election fraud, I want to just say in passing, is Richard Chernin, and he has this blog, and you'll find a lot of information about, he's done a lot of, re, he's like a statistician, so he has done um, a lot of research research on election fraud for decades, really. So um, he had calculated, Richard Chernin had calculated that uh Donald Trump had actually won a landslide in 2016, but they didn't rig the election enough for Hillary to win. Um, so um, Trump, he calculates that Trump probably won the popular vote too, not just the electoral college. And a lot of Hillary supporters or Democrats will say, oh, but Hillary got 3 million more votes than uh, Donald Trump. But I think most of those almost all of those were in California where there's a lot of <laughs> voting irregularity. And, uh, and Cal what's interesting in California, there is a figure named uh, an official election official named Michael Vu. And he got into some legal trouble when he was an election official in Ohio. And if you know anything about election fraud in the U S Ohio, is a key state, a key swing state. And um, there's often election fraud uh, rigging the election in Ohio. And there's a couple of examples of that. And um, a George W. Bush official, Carl Rove, uh, his name comes up often when you're talking about um, fixing an election in Ohio because that's where Karl Rowe likes to fix, fix elections. Okay, so I remember back in 2016, whoop, that's the wrong video. Um, well, maybe I'll start with, so talk about Karl Rowe here. Maybe I'll just kind of mention this first. So Karl Rowe, uh, in 2004, he fixed the election in Ohio, the swing state. And uh, actually, John Kerry, the Democratic Party nominee, um, would have won if it had not been for Karl Rove's fixing of the Ohio results. Um, and... Um, in 2012, he tried to do the same thing, but um, apparently the story is that the FBI was watching, and you got to remember, okay, uh, the thing I've learned about the FBI, everybody thinks the FBI is squeaky clean, but we've learned that in 2016, they were trying to sabotage um, Donald Trump's election and they have also tried to sabotage um uh donald trump's presidency not that i'm a trump supporter trump is just as bad as hillary would have been if not worse um so the problem is the fbi was watching and uh, Ohio results in 2012, they were watching to make sure there was not going to be a fix because 2012, okay, uh, Barack Obama's running for re-election and Barack Obama, the Wall Street loved Barack Obama. So I don't think they wanted, I think they preferred Barack Obama over Mitt Romney and Barack Obama has this image that he was on the left, but he was doing everything the big business this is the key theme here, big business wanted. So anyway, so apparently they wanted, um, so the FBI does <laughs> what big business wants or the ruling class wants. And so uh, Karl Rove was not able to fix Ohio. And uh, there was a famous segment on when um, Karl Rove was on Fox News and they suddenly announced uh the uh yeah <laughs> on fox news he was on camera and um fox news suddenly called ohio for barack obama 
<laughs> and Carl Rose says, wait a minute. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's right. And but the story is nobody told Carl Rove that the fix was off, that the FBI was watching. So they weren't able to fix the election. So that's the story about 2012. Um, and I remember that uh, Mitt Romney and his running mate, um, his name escapes my memory right now. Uh, they came out kind of sheepishly and they were not expecting to lose. And it's because they knew that Carl Rowe, Carl Rowe was trying to fix the election in Ohio for them. Yeah, so that's interesting. lots of interesting stories about election fraud in the U.S. Um, so, oh, another thing. I mentioned that, uh, you know, electronic voting, so it's a big business. Electronic voting, yeah, businesses um, make a lot of money from supplying these electronic voting machines to uh, um, states, counties in the U.S. It's big business and it makes them really easy to bring election to fix elections. Um, so in 2016, so as uh, whenever I would cast absentee ballots, um, uh, it would be the paper ballot and I would fill in a bubble, you know, the bubble, the bubble card, bubble sheet. And those are scanned electronically. There's optical scanners, optical scanners that scan those paper ballots. And there is a very good, I'm going to give the links to all this information and maybe more. There's a lot of information about election fraud in the US. It's very interesting. So I remember watching this documentary in 2016 or 2017 called Hacking Democracy. And it's a 26, 26 H, HBO um, documentary. So it's been around for 14 years. Um, and it followed, they followed this uh, woman, Bev Harris, and she founded Black Box Voting. And she does a lot, she's done a lot of, she's a writer, researcher. She's done a lot of work on this and she still is at it. And she has a website, which uh, I'll have to find. I, I, know, I think it's just blackboxvoting.org or something. I'll find it. So this is a very interesting documentary, an hour and 21, 22 minutes. Um, very interesting. I recommend it very much. So about optical um, scanners. So towards the end of this video, um, there is an election official in Tallahassee, Florida, who's concerned about uh, the elections um, in his district, his area. So he invited Bev Harris and some other people that work with her to come in and do a test of the optical scanners that he has. So they pick a machine, they create a ballot and ask a simple question on the ballot. So they print out, they have eight copies of the ballot. And um, so there are eight people and they each fill in a bubble um, yeah, it's a yes or no question. So um, two of them vote yes and six vote no. So the election official, he takes machine. There's a memory card. There's a memory card and the memory, memory card is key. So the memory card has been prepared by um, a tech person that was working with Bev on this exercise and he's prepared the memory card that goes into the machine to um, process the the votes so um, they insert the memory card into the machine now this is back in 2006 I'm sure things are a little bit different but similar they insert memory card they turn on the machine they scan the eight ballots. So two um, have the yes vote, six no. They scan them and then there's a printout of the results that the machine puts out. So the printout says, so two yes, six no. 
the results are in the printout, seven yes and one no, completely flipped and then some. And the election official was fraud. And I think there was another of uh, um, election worker there at the time was in tears, very upset because they realized um, how bad things were. And the election official said, you know, if he, he didn't know better, you know, he would have to certify that election, um, you know, and he didn't know that they could do that with these electronic voting machines or optical scanners. So some of the machines I think are touchscreen, they're different types of electronic voting, but this is the problem with electronic voting and there's no verification of the vote. There's no paper trail or anything. And, um, uh, another thing is Jimmy Carter, so the former president, he actually has an, organ, um, an organization that monitors elections around the world. And he has said there is no way that U.S. elections could be monitored. Um, no way. Um, because of this electronic voting. And I think there's been some protest or something. <laughs> I think there's a Max Blumenthal uh stunt where he's trying to get the um, organization of american states to monitor u.s elections as you know max blumenthal is just a ruling class tool very interesting video there's a lot in here another interesting video that i highly recommend is this one i remember watching this in 2016 so this was um uh election integrity people i believe or trust vote sometimes um they're called um so these figures are from right to left so this is clip uh no bob fatrakis and he's a lawyer journalist i believe uh bob fatake <laughs> bob fatrakis cliff arnebeck in the middle and that is Lori grace and they gave this presentation to a group in California, a very modest presentation. So a small group gathered and they talked about the exit polling uh, discrepancy. They talked about election fraud, but they were focusing a little bit on the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, campaign. And so these are Bernie Sanders supporters, basically. And they are talking about the um, election fraud in the democratic primaries in 2016 but they get into the big topic of um election fraud uh over the years in the u.s and um um so there's a lot of uh it actually they show some videos too so it's not just them presenting information and talking to this group. Uh, and they show some videos, some very interesting videos. Um, and one of the stories is about Stephen Spoonamore. Now, Stephen Spoonamore um, is mentioned in a video that Scott did, and this is from his Nomadic Everyman um, blog. And he did this video um in august of 2018 so coming up on almost two years and he talked about spoon more um and the man in the middle and how the elections um are stolen in the u.s and there are more players in this um than what i'm talking about this is a big topic but uh it's very interesting I don't vote anymore. I don't get emotionally involved, but it's important to know this. So he talked about Stephen Spoonamore. Stephen Spoonamore is a Republican, um, longtime Republican, but he was supporting Bernie Sanders in 2016. And Stephen Spoonamore uh, investigates bank and computer fraud. And he exposed um, the man in the middle, the, what was going on in Ohio. And, you know, this is something that concerns just not just Democrats, but Republicans too. So 
you know, and independents and everybody. So this is not just a Democratic Party concern. This is everybody concerned about elections in the US, that they're not free and fair. And uh, it's like the mob. The mob is running. The mob is running the big business, um, is running elections. Um, and big business often acts like the mob. And I'll, I'll get into that and kind of explain that. And it is, all this, uh, this video in particular kind of reminded me of um, Whitney Webb's um, reporting on the Jeffrey Epstein ring and the origins of that and all the connections there. A little bit. It's kind of like that. So there's some cloak, or, cloak and dagger stuff in here and in this video. Um, it's a long video. It's two hours and 40 minutes, but I, I, it's interesting and it's worth watching and I highly recommend this video. So anyway, they're talking about Stephen Spoonamore, and he exposed the fraud of the man in the middle in Ohio, and he exposed um, a Washington D.C. power player who worked with uh, who worked um, with the George W. Bush people, particularly Karl Rove, and um, so Stephen Spoonamore uh, exposed. Uh, a man named Mike Connell who worked with Rove in the Bushes, George W. Bush. Mike Connell. Um, so in there's a number of videos in this video in this yeah there's a number of segments in this video that where they're showing reporting about Stephen Spoonmore. He he talks on camera about the man in the middle and how elections. <laughs> are um, rigged, fixed in Ohio. Um, so um, they play the video, Mike Connell, Mike Connell, he, when Stephen Spoonamore exposed him as fixing elections in Ohio, or specifically the elect the 2004 election, uh, Mike Connell, was subpoenaed and he was supposed to testify about this. Um, and apparently Mike Connell was very reluctant to testify and he was getting threatened. And I think Carl Rowe, it came out, I think Carl Rowe was threatening him. Carl Rowe wanted him to take the fall for this and not uh, lay the blame elsewhere or higher up. Um, so I don't know, Mike Connell was caught in kind of a jam. Um, he was a true believer in the Republican Party. Um, so he wanted, he was reluctant to testify and also he was getting threatened and he, um, he had a private plane and he was a private pilot, you know, and um, he was having problems with his plane. And unfortunately, he went to Washington, D.C., as I guess he often did. He lived in Ohio. Um, so he met with someone probably about this case in Washington, D.C. And so he was getting threats. And when he flew himself back to Ohio, his plane crashed. And uh, I forget, uh, I'm not sure where it crashed. It might have been, I think it crashed in Ohio. I'm not sure. It's a plane crash, probably in Ohio, because I've heard a lot of um, dodgy things about Ohio. Uh, there's a lot of states that have dodgy things, but that's one place. It's dodgy. So anyway, his plane crash, he was killed. It crashed at night, so he was flying back just before Christmas. It crashed, um, and the the investigation was botched. So they're supposed if a plane crashes at night, they're supposed to um, cordon off the crash site, um, have it guarded at night to make sure it's not tampered with. And then when there's daylight and they can see better, they um, will sort through the wreckage, you know, very carefully to um, make sure that all the evidence is saved for any investigation of the crash. Well, they didn't do that. So they, they marked off, they uh, cordoned off the area at night 
they put up lights and they quickly uh, cleared out the wreckage and his remains, um, Mike Connell's remains, and um, made a mess of things. So they couldn't have a proper investigation of what had happened and um, whether or not his plane had been sabotaged or whatever, which it probably was. Um, unfortunately, his wife went to the crash scene and um, because they had cleared the wreckage and his remains at night, um, there were still bits of flesh that she found. Um, so she was convinced that he was murdered. I think his sister was convinced that he was murdered. Um, and um, Stephen Spoonmore apparently uh, warned Cliff Arnebeck that the people that they're dealing with who are fixing these elections, rigging elections, who are responsible for election fraud, whack people. So people die of this. You know, it's this is why I say it's like the mob. So it's uh, these cloak and dagger stories. Um, the other thing about the Mike Connell case was uh, there was an anonymous letter that they got later um, investigators got later, or I'm not sure, I can't remember who got. And it had a memo from, um, um, that was signed by um, Mark Felt. And it, it, it classified Mike Connell as a national security threat. And so shortly after, so, um, Mike Felt, Mark Felt, who was a Watergate's deep throat, um, he died in 2008. Um, so this memo was before, I guess, before the crash and before his death. You know, he'd written it before his death, Mark Felt. So Mark Felt, if you know anything about Watergate, Mark Felt was deep throat and that was a soft coup. Mark Felt was the deputy director of the FBI and he was supposed to be um, J. Edgar Hoover's um, successor. Um, but Richard Nixon appointed someone else to be the director of the FBI. So this was a conspiracy to take down, to sabotage Richard Nixon's presidency and get him out of office. Because another thing is apparently Nixon wasn't far enough to the right for big business interests. So Mark Felt, yeah, Deep Throat had classified um, Mike Connell, the man in the middle, as um, a national security threat. So um, Mike Connell worked with this um, software company called Smart Tech, and that's how he was able to fix elections in Ohio. So they he was able to from the company i think they were able to uh tap into the machines electronic voting machines and um so as the results were being transmitted to uh the central location that would report the official results so the apparently the um i think the the votes would go through this uh area at smart tech where uh, Mike Connell had um, figured out how to uh, fix the election. So that's how they were being fixed. Scott goes into that more, I think, in his video about um, Spoonamore. So the man in the middle is the story. So this is a very interesting video. And as I have said, um, there's a lot of cloak and dagger stories uh, connected to election fraud in the US. It's very dirty business. It's uh, and elections. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Lori Gowan also, before she introduces the video about Mike Connell, she says exposing, she states clearly, and I hadn't remembered this until I looked at that part, that exposing election fraud in the U.S. is bad for business. Yes. So it's in the interest of big business to behave like the mob and uh, fix elections, rig elections um, any way they can and make sure they get the results that they want. And it doesn't sound like that happened in 2016 when Trump was elected. So that's what all the Russia gate hysteria is about, trying to connect Trump to Russia. 
Anyway, this is a big, big, big story. And I'm sorry if uh, it's long, but this is very interesting stuff. And I will give you as many links as I can. I'll give you all of these links and more. And these videos, I highly recommend them. So this video and the hacking democracy, very good videos to watch. And then you will understand, you will understand why your vote doesn't count. And it's because election fraud is a big business. Yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching. And I appreciate all my viewers and I get some very good intelligent comments uh, whenever I post a video. So I appreciate that. And I get a lot of very good information from viewers. They supply me with information and keep me informed. So. There's a lot of things, uh, other things going on in the world. Um, um, coronavirus is another topic. There's a lot of information about that that still hasn't really come out enough, I think. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, International Women's Day and how that's been hijacked, too, and uh, in, particular, in particular in Mexico right now. So anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, listening, and I will talk to you again soon. Okay, bye.